Hi, my name is Walford Kaufman. I'm the pastor of Southside Baptist Church in Gaffney, South Carolina. We invite you to come uh, to our worship services on Sunday morning at 1030, where we are meeting right now in our Family Life Center due to social distancing. Uh, but we invite you to come. But this is a sermon that I'll be preaching there on Sunday, January the 17th, 2021. And so uh, glad that you're joining us this way. I'm doing this kind of two, uh, two phases. One is I'm preaching this because it's a good practice for me. And the second thing is just in case something happened, we had to call off service, or I maybe even got sick. We still have this. But I'm glad that you're a part of this worship experience. If you would look at John, the fourth chapter, verses 1 through 25. John 4, 1 through 25. So the question I have as we begin this sermon is, why does the thought of witnessing scare us? Just idea. If I walked up to you and, and start ask you, would you go with me to go witness to someone? Or I ask you to just witness to those in your own family. Witness to those uh, that you work with, those that you go to school with. What would be the answer? You know, why do we get scared? Is it because we might feel inadequate? Man, I, I, I've got my problems. I've got my, my life. I, I'm not perfect. None of us are. But is it because we feel inadequate? Are we scared we might be misunderstood? You know, here I am wanting to talk to somebody. Will they understand the real meaning and what I'm saying? Is it because maybe because Satan has our attention more than Jesus? And that's an awful way to look at it, right? That Jesus, he'd be second to Satan. But which one are we listening to? Because Jesus tells us to go and to share the gospel. Satan says no, and then gives us all these different reasons. So who are we listening to? Let's pray as we begin. Father, as we look at your precious word, as we learn what we're supposed to be doing, Lord, just just let our minds be open, our hearts be open. I pray this, everyone that's joined us by either listening or watching this, that this day, Lord, will be a day they grow in their spiritual walk. Let us all be about your work, your way, and your perfect will. In Jesus' name, amen. So as you get got your Bibles open, look there. I'm reading out of the NIV. Now, Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that he was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John, although, in fact, it was not Jesus who baptized, but his disciples. So he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. Now he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria named Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. And the Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? for Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman replied, You have said nothing to draw with, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his livestock? And Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water, welling up to eternal life. And the woman said to him, Sir, Give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. And he told her, Go call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. And Jesus said to her, You are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is you have had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. Sir, the woman said, 
I can see that you're a prophet. Our ancestors worship on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Woman, Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in the Spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is Spirit, and His worshipers must worship in the Spirit and in truth. And the woman said, I know that Messiah called Christ is coming. When He comes, He will explain everything to us. Let me go ahead and read verse 26. Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am He. How wonderful that scripture is. But we see the first thing in this scripture today is the fear of controversy. It starts off in this chapter. The Pharisees had heard that Jesus, though it wasn't Jesus' disciples, were baptizing more than John the Baptist. And the Pharisees really didn't care that much about John the Baptist. But they just got into a controversy. But see, Jesus was not scared to take them on. But he just didn't want to waste his time. His time on this earth was short. And so he wanted to get about the message. He didn't want to get caught up in the controversy. So he moved on. Sometimes we need to realize in our life that what we think are closed doors are just opening new opportunities for us. So, so many times churches, believers get caught into controversy, want to debate this and debate that instead of getting out and doing the message that they're supposed to be doing and telling people about Jesus. And so how many of you, though, are old school like I am? If you want to get to a place, the straight path is the best way, right? If I'm here at plan a, uh, a point A and I want to get to point B, I draw a straight line and that's where I want to go. Well, this is what kind of makes this interesting, this situation here. Uh, for Jesus and the disciples, they needed to be going back to Galilee. But to do that, they had to go through Samaria. Now, they had an option. They did have an option. They could take six days and go around Samaria, or they could go three days walking and go right through Samaria. But, whoa, whoa, problems are there. See, this problem about the Samaritans were century old problems of the Jews and the Samaritans. The Samaritans, uh, a mixed breed, I think they said five different breeds of people were in that area. Uh, so they were not pure Jews. And so many have, were considered the Samaritans nothing but dogs. That's how bad it was. And so here it was, six days around, three days through, so they take off. And then they come to the well of Jacob. It's in, a, it's in the middle of the crossroads there at a junction. And it was a, it was a place that had a lot of Jewish history. A lot of Jewish history there. And this well is a hundred feet deep. Oh, some cold water in that kind of uh, environment there. And so here it was. Uh, you had to have something to get that water out. And they had things back in that days, uh, more like a leather type pouches. We, we're thinking of a bucket, right? But these were more like leather type uh, pouches with rope tied to it and they would carry them. Most likely, one of the disciples had that kind of pouch for they ran up on wells like that, needed water and something to carry water in. But his assignment most likely was to carry that pouch. But remember, all the disciples have gone into Sychar. All of them have gone into Sychar. But it's kind of strange that all the disciples went. Uh, but don't judge them. Uh, this was something very revolutionary for them. For they were Jews. And to go into a Samaritan city? Uh, we kind of think, well, they were all bunched up. They were scared to death. Yeah, might have been scared, but just the idea of them going into that city, some barriers were being torn down. Some barrier, barriers in a small way were coming down. But isn't that the problem with most of our witnessing is that we're the fear of barriers, fear of things between us and others. See, they... 
They had gone to Samaria and left Jesus all by himself. But why worry? You got to remember this. It was midday. For a Jewish day is 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. This was the middle of the day. It was noontime. The heat was its greatest, and nobody would be coming out there to bother Jesus. So that's why it's not that they, they had to huddle and go in as a little group to protect themselves. They just went into the Samaritan city because Jesus should be all, I mean, he should be okay by himself. But Jesus was human. Isn't that great to know? See, that's the good thing. God became flesh, and he understands what this body goes through. He understands the situations in our life. And so all this is happening. And so here he was, he was thirsty, and he was tired, but he was not too tired to love. That's the wonderful thing about it. He was not too tired to love. And we've all heard about this woman, haven't we? We've all heard about this woman. She's an outcast. She's all by herself. It's the heat of the day. A Jacob's well was a good half a mile from Sychar. And so there had to be a, a, a well in that city. I mean, that's what you did in that day, folks. That's what you did. You built or uh, dug a well in the city. Or really, you dug the well and then you built the city around it or the town or the village or whatever. There had to be some water source there. But she chose to come in the heat of the day by herself to get this water. A barrier. See, she's a Samaritan and she's also a woman. She, Jesus was a Jew, a man. He was called teacher, a rabbi. And all a rabbi was forbidden to talk to a woman in public. Can you believe that? A, a rabbi was forbidden to teach, excuse me, to, to talk to a lady in public. That meant his wife he could not speak to in public. His sister he could not speak to. His own daughter he could not speak to in public. Uh, I didn't know this until I was preparing this. There were some Pharisees who called themselves the bruised and bleeding Pharisees. Now that's a very unique group. I don't know if I want to be in that group. The bruised and bleeding Pharisees. And why they got that name was, they took it upon themselves as they were walking the streets. If they were approaching a woman, they would close their eyes so they wouldn't see the woman. Now you know why they were called bruised and broken like that, and bleeding and all this? The bruised and bleeding Pharisees because having their eyes closed, they tripped over things. They walked into walls just so they wouldn't see the woman. But here, you know, here's Jesus, a religious leader. He could lose his uh, reputation. He could, uh, but that didn't matter to Jesus. That didn't matter to Jesus at all. Jesus looked beyond those barriers. He's a man, she's a woman. He's a Jew, she's a, a Samaritan. And not only she's a Samaritan, she is on the lower level because of her reputation and all this. See, Jesus looked beyond those barriers and he could see a heart that was broken. But see, that leads us to another fear that many of us have. And that's the fear of involvement. Involvement. In verse 10, in, in this conversation here, Jesus tells of the living water. Well, in verse 11, if you look at that situation, uh, what does she do in that situation? It's almost like she's making fun of Jesus. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Uh, isn't that kind of strange that that's happened in that situation? That, uh, that she's questioning him. She had eyes. She could tell he didn't have anything to bring up that water. But take note of this. A perfect Savior, a perfect Savior, Jesus Christ, was still misunderstood. So don't think if you're going out witnessing, you're going to share, you're going to lay out this perfect plan and, you know, of salvation, and they're going to understand it all. Are they understanding your words? Are they understanding that concept? Even Jesus was misunderstood. That's why she comes back. Well, I, you don't have anything to get the water up. But what did Jesus do? He saw her heart, and he knew the brokenness of it, and he cared enough to remind her 
to remind her of her own thirst. That's why in verse 16 he says, uh, uh, call your husband and come back. Oh, wow. That got right to the problem. That simple little statement hit right at the heart of the problem. Right at the heart. The emptiness of her life, her immorality, her inadequacies. One relationship after another had failed. Five husbands. And the man she's with now, not even her husband. See, there we see in that situation that fear that comes of getting involved. Sometimes we pay a price for getting involved. But that's what Christ has called us to do. And then we see the fear of the unknown. Now Jesus knew, but we don't always know. We do not know how people are going to respond when we share the gospel message. People, we don't know how people are going to respond when we confront them about their sin. Uh, when we witness... How are people going to respond? But this woman, she was beautifully honest. Beautifully honest. William Barclay did say this, that Christianity begins with a sense of sin. We're awake, in, we're awake to ourselves and we're awake to our need of God. See, that's the beautiful thing about this woman. She did not deny it. She realized the sin in her life and she admitted it. I've been on some uh, uh, mission trips. And I tell you what, in some other countries, it is great to witness because many times when I, I go to share the gospel, the people will quickly say, no, I do not know Jesus. No, I've never invited Jesus. No, I'm, I'm living a life of sin. They admit it. What we do in America today many times is when we're confronted by someone about our sin, we make excuses. This woman did not make an excuse. She did not. And so she got honest. And that's what William Barclay is saying here. We're awakened to ourselves and our need for God. Sin. So the woman was surrendering to the unknown. The same woman who was scared of those people back in the village, in those townspeople, she surrendered to Jesus. And why I know that? Look what happened to her. If you read on some more in that chapter, it was immediate change in her life. It was incredible. It was impelling what that woman did. She ran back to the very people who had put her down and she was lifting them up. She was encouraging them. She grabbed them by the hand. She knocked on the doors. The doors had been shut to her, but she knocked on those doors and she invited them to come meet Jesus. And that's what we're called to do today. We're sinners, not perfect but when we're saved, we go and witness, we tell people, the very people that put us down, about Jesus. See, do we have the fear of the truth? The fear of the truth, the reality of our sin, gives us hope. Did you realize that? When we finally admit, I am a sinner, I'm disobedient to God, I have never trusted Him, or I have never put my total faith in Him, when we admit this, it opens up, oh, it opens up so many opportunities in our life. See, the reality of our sin gives us hope when we can see that we can't save ourselves. We can't even change ourselves. We also see the wonder of knowing that our sin can be forgiven. We, it doesn't, uh, this forgiveness does not have to be earned. We don't have to work for it. We just need to trust Jesus. See, the truth and, and when we see our sins, the beauty in, of worshiping an almighty God in spirit and in truth. He deals with this in this scripture about worshiping in spirit and truth. It doesn't matter if you're there on the mountain next Sychar or you're in Jerusalem. It's where you are in the spirit and yes, in the truth of God. So the truth, are you living a life that glorifies the Lord? No, 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 no. I didn't say compare yourself with others. I don't, 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 don't say, well, my mama, my daddy, that's between them and the Lord. What about you? Are you living a life that glorifies the Lord? So think about it. Today, let's all come to the well. Let's all come to the well, for there's where Jesus is at. This woman who was an outcast, who nobody wanted to be around, except for a man or two every once in a while. 
All that she had lived in her life of sin, she came to the well and there was Jesus. In her loneliness, she found Jesus. Let's come to the well because we all stand in need. I don't care if you're the best Christian in your church. We all stand in need. Come to the well. Come to the well because we need this living water. His name is Jesus. His name is Jesus. Now I know some of you are there in your homes, maybe you listen to this car, and there's a, there's a loud noise right now. There's a loud noise going on. And if you check it out real good, it is Satan. It is Satan playing that voice of his over and over in your head saying you're not worthy. You don't have to. Making up every excuse could be not to follow Jesus. See, this woman could have said, let me think about it. What would have happened? But instead, this woman left everything right there and went and told people about Jesus. See, that's the strangest thing. There are, the, Satan is playing this game in your head right now saying you're not worthy. And then, even after you get saved, even after you get saved, what happens? There's Satan that comes in and says, but you can't tell anybody. Why not tell people? I'm a sinner saved by grace. I'm a sinner that wants you to know Jesus Christ as your Savior. The taste of that living water. So today, get to the truth. Don't be scared of the truth. The truth is what sets us free. I think I've heard that before, haven't you? But today, I want you to realize... God loves you so much that He sent His Son to the wells of this world of ours, waiting for us who wants that living water to come to it. Today, trust Jesus. Simply confess your sin and invite Jesus in your heart. For you that need to rededicate your life, if you need to rededicate your life, simply confess your sins. Yes, you have sinned. Because you're not giving it totally over to the Lord. Give everything over. Rededicate your life. you got a brand new start. Just like that woman. Just like that woman in the well who walked up and all of that sin ran back into that city a new person in Jesus Christ. You can have that today. I want to pray with you. I want to encourage you. Let me know of your decision Pastor at GaffneySouthside.com Pastor at GaffneySouthside.com Or my cell phone, call me, uh, text, or whatever it may be, 864-812-0073 That's 864-812-0073 I'd love to know of your decision. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank You this day that You sent Your Son that learn how to walk in this body of ours. And He knows what it's like to be tired. He knows what it's like to be thirsty. But thank You that He never knew what it's like to sin. And that's why we can trust in Jesus. Father, thank You that You give us this opportunity to come to the well and trust and walk away different. Let us do that. Let us be obedient. Let us get to the truth. And thank You for loving us. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, Lord bless you, and we'll see you next week.